Thank you all for joining us. I'm Ann Galloway, the editor of VT Digger, a statewide nonprofit news organization that serves Vermont. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce you tonight to Wynne Smith, the former owner and president of Sugarbush. Wynne also served on the board of the Vermont Ski Areas Association and is the immediate past chair of the National Ski Areas Association. Thank you, Wynne, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us for the fourth in a series of FAQ live events held by VT Digger. Many local residents and people out of state want to ski this winter at Vermont's resorts. And this year, during the pandemic, there is potentially an even higher pent up demand for outdoor opportunities. Wynne is going to talk with me tonight about what the options are during COVID and for making the most of the season. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Mike Doherty, the digital editor for VT Digger, who is producing our live stream tonight, and thank the generous sponsor of the FAQ Live series, Garnet Health. Garnet Health provides both rapid antigen and PCR COVID-19 testing for individuals and businesses seven days a week. Garnet also offers expanded testing, including flu AB for symptomatic clients. Schedule a test today at their new location next to Burlington International Airport by visiting www.garnet.care slash testing. Wynne, I wanna thank you again for joining us tonight. There's an incredibly high interest <laughs> in the rules for skiing during COVID. We continue to receive questions right up until the start time this evening. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, and I just wondered if you could uh, give us an overview of what this season could look like. Sure, Ann, thanks. It's nice being with you. Should correct one thing. I'm no longer on the Vermont Ski Area Association okay. Board. I was for many, many years, but being retired, I stepped down from that. Okay, um, sorry but, about that. You know, this is, I mean, everybody knows this is going to be a different ski season. Um, and we just have to understand that and be ready for it. You know, the words that I think everybody should think about and remember are plan. You know, it's going to be important to plan ahead. It can't be as spontaneous, as flexible as we've been in the past. Patience is another word that I think is really important. You know, we're going to have to learn a little bit more about patience. Lift lines are likely to be longer because there's going to be social distancing. It's not going to be easy to access lodges. You know, there's not going to be immediate run to the bathroom. There's going to be restrictions and limitations on how many people can come into a lodge at one time. So we're all going to have to have patience, which, you know, isn't necessarily natural, especially on a powder day. Uh, I think also we're going to have to be flexible. Things are going to change. You know, the, the state regulations change frequently, and we're going to have to adapt and be flexible with those. And then the other thing is understanding. Um, it's really difficult to plan the ski business right now. You know, I, I was in it for 20 years. I'm glad I'm retired because it's tough. And I know what my colleagues are going through, not only at Sugarbush, but in every ski area that, that I'm familiar with. They've been working for months, being prepared, they're working hard. And a lot of what they're gonna to have to do, they don't necessarily like, they're not gonna really enjoy doing it, but they're gonna to have to do it. And I think Lindsay Delorier at Bolton uh, said it best. I watched the video she has on her website, which is worth watching. It's very honest and frank. And in it, she said, you know, I'm going to have to do things that aren't going to be that enjoyable for you or for me, but we're going to have to do it because this year our primary focus is on one safety and two surviving and surviving is key. Uh, ski areas are not going to be making a lot of money. It's going to be challenging just to break even. And so there has to be an understanding that they want to survive. They have to survive, but there are going to have to be some changes in order to make that happen this year. Yeah. So I think the good news is uh, the outdoor part of skiing should be well run. You know, I thought we, we saw with golf this uh, season that you can organize an outdoor activity very safely. You know, there is going to be different guidelines and how you access lifts, but the skiing part of it itself is, a, I think, going to be very good. And what we all have to do is make sure that we don't mess that up so we close that down. But what's going to be restricted is the indoor activities, so the ski rental the tuning, the dining activities, the retail activities, those are all gonna have limitations. And that's just gonna to have to, you know, sort of be an understanding. But in many ways, what every ski area I have listened to has been telling customers is this year you have to think of your car as the baseline. You know, most people are not gonna have 
lodges open for changing or storage. So it's gonna be required to really boot up in your car, come ready to get right on the lift. Not terribly convenient, you know, it's something we're gonna to have to get used to, but I think, again, that's one of the, the things that just is gonna to have to happen to keep scaries um, opening and functioning. Uh, most of the scaries that I know of are actually trying to do more outdoor dining. They're bringing in food trucks. They're putting different outdoor pickup opportunities. There's gonna be more fire pits. There are heaters being installed on buildings so that you can still you know, be around and more comfortable with having to go inside as one naturally does. Um, obviously, there's a, a lot of questioning about what are the state guidelines. And every ski area that I know of is really has to have their guests attest. And that is really sign a waiver, just like you sign a normal waiver. Attest that you have read the state guidelines, you're familiar with the current guidelines, and you're following them. The ski areas themselves can't be the enforcement agent. It's really going to be put on the shoulders of the guests that they have read and they are following the guidelines. But before a pass is activated, one will have to sign and attest. If one buys a ticket, one has to attest. So that is really gonna be some of the check and balance on it. Is it perfect? No, it's not. But you know, that's really what we are faced with you know, as a ski industry. And that's how it will be operating for the season, I'm sure. Hmm. Boy, that was a, a great overview, Wynn. I'm going to turn now to our questions because, like I said, we have so many, and um, uh, Mike Doherty is going to uh, give us a voiceover question uh, from one of our readers. Okay. Good morning. I am calling to inquire about homeowners from across the border who typically come to Vermont ski areas for the season. Um, it would entail back and forth travel and how do those restrictions that governor has currently put in place affect those who own a home and regularly ski in the state? This is one of the, the challenges and you know one of the, the real concerns. Um, obviously, you can't prevent somebody from coming to their own home. But what the governor has currently said, and these are the current guidelines. So again, I emphasize current because it may change next week and hopefully it does. But currently, if you're coming from out of state, you have to quarantine for 14 days or quarantine for 10 days and take a test. Now quarantine, and as I understand it, can also be done in your home. Let's say if you're in Connecticut and you really have home quarantined according to the guidelines of the governor, my understanding is that you are able to drive to Vermont and you don't have to then quarantine again. So there is a definition of quarantining and you know, I really refer everybody to the state guidelines. So I don't interpret, but that you can read in yourselves, but that is my understanding of the current guidelines in terms of out-of-state travel here. And so, um, like you said, people should go to the state website to see what quarantining entails, but some of the things that we talked about earlier include uh, if you're quarantining, you can't go to the grocery store for two weeks. If you're quarantining, you can't have a child at home who's going to school. So there, there are really strict guidelines around this. And uh, you know, if people have questions, they, they should refer to the, the very excellent uh, Vermont Department of Health website. Yeah. And, you know, it does change, Anne. As we saw this summer, we used to have the color-coded map. So mm -hmm. we have a home in Litchfield County, and for a long time, it was green. So I could go to Litchfield County and come back without quarantine, but now it's red. So if I go down there and I don't quarantine absolutely there, then I have to quarantine when I come back to Vermont. Yeah, it's a, it's a we constantly all have to be updating our, our uh, our, the personal information we need to, to move ahead. Um, we're going to hear now from Brian, who lives in Wilmington. Hi, good morning. This is Brian uh, from Wilmington. Uh, I'm calling with a question about what could be done to make the resort experience even safer uh, this season uh, by further reducing capacity uh, or reducing lift lines, um, ensuring that more lifts are run. And uh, the other part of this as well is safety on the hill, because uh, any, anyone who's going to a hospital right now for an injury, um, 
shouldn't be there. We need that capacity for other use. That's my question. Thank you. Brian, those, those are all great questions. Let me take the first um, one. I believe all resorts are really trying to limit capacity in some way. And again, every resort is doing it a little bit differently in their own way. So you have to really look specifically to see how they're doing it. Let me give you an example. The way Killington is currently looking at limiting capacity on the hill is by requiring parking reservations. There's no fee for the parking, but in order to get in, you have to have a parking reservation. Stowe and the other Vail resorts are actually requiring a reservation for your pass, if you're a pass holder, epic pass holder, to be active. And there's limited ticketing done in advance. Sugarbush, which is part of the Altera family, is not requiring anybody to make a reservation if they are a pass holder or to have parking reservations, but they are limiting the capacity by really restricting the number of day tickets sold. So this year, for example, you cannot walk up to the window and buy a ticket. You have to buy in advance and there is limited supply based per day um, and purchase it online and it will be activated and you can go directly to the lift. Uh, the lodging is actually following the state guidelines. And I'll give you an example because I'm familiar with Sugarbush. Our cafeteria, which typically can seat 450 to close to 500 people on a busy weekend. One half of that has been carved out for reserved seated dining. The limit is 75 people. All the tables are spaced more than six feet apart. It requires online reservations online ordering. So that's one way of limiting the, uh, the risk indoor dining. If you're going to rent equipment, you have to do that online and it's pretty much delivered you know, quickly and some of it even out of doors. There are no group lessons. And right now the governor has actually restricted um, to households what can actually be done as a group setting. So each area is really looking at the limitations how to control capacity. Lift lines, you're likely to see ghost lanes in between lanes. And by a ghost lane, I mean you'll see a lane with people, a big space, a lane with people, space. So it's really spreading people out dramatically. If you have a high-speed quad, it's gonna be limited to two people instead of four people, unless people are from the same household and agree to ride together. If somebody gets in line and they want to go solo at Sugarbush, that's going to be permitted. Now, that's going to be a safer environment, but as I said about patients, it's likely to cause longer lift lines. So there is going to be you know, a cause and effect that we're just going to have to get used to. So those are just some examples, but what I would suggest, every ski area has a website. Every ski area I have looked at has their COVID guidelines and what they're doing in terms of safety cleaning, spacing, you know, et cetera. And I'd encourage you to look at that specific website of the ski area you're gonna to choose to ski at. Great. Um, sorry, my, uh, my dog is barking in the background. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Carolyn of South Burlington uh, says, she's usually a solo skier and typically uses the singles line at the lift. How will that work this year? Will she have a chair to herself? <laughs> well, Carolyn, I, I sort of answered that right now. And again, I'm not sure how every single ski area is going to operate. So again, you have to look at a specific area. Uh, I do know at Sugarbush, they are not going to have single lines. Mm. So you'll be getting this line. But once again, I said, if you get to that chair and you say, I don't want to go with anybody, uh, that is going to be permitted. Great. Uh, Tim from Ludlow wants to know um, if resort operators have a plan or a trigger point where a given resort would completely shut down or reduce skier traffic significantly more than it already has this season in the event of a large outbreak tied to the resort or the town in which it resides. Well, Tim, hopefully that, that won't happen. Uh, I think the, the first part of your question is I think that's going to be determined probably by the government, by the state a total shutdown. Now, I think what all ski operators are hoping is that we're really gonna have a behavior that doesn't cause a total shutdown. 
you know, if we are all conscious about wearing masks, if we're social distancing, if we're doing the right things, that's going to create a probability that we'll be able to remain open for skiing outdoors. Now, should there be an outbreak at a resort, then everyone has, I'm sure, their protocols that they're going to follow. And it's going to be very specific in terms of what has actually happened there and specific to that individual resort. So every resort, again, has their guidelines, they have their protocol, and they're following exactly what both the CDC is recommending as well as the state. Thank you. It, it is a very tricky time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what you're going to find, when you, you go around, you're going to see that masks are going to be required. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're on premise, once you're out of your car, masks are going to be required. And I, I did my first day of skiing today, and getting used to a mask, you know, it's going to take a little getting used to. Um, I know somebody asked, do you have to wear a mask or could you wear a buff? Well, my understanding is you need two layers for a mask to be effective. So, you know, masks are really going to be what everybody's going to be looking at and asking them to please wear it. And I think every resort is going to be very strict on that uh, once they're, they're on premise. Well, that's, that's, that's good to know. That's going to be a new experience for a lot of people. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Elaine, who lives in Littleton, New Hampshire. Elaine asks, I live in Littleton, New Hampshire, and I've had a season pass to Burke for almost 20 years. Would it be inappropriate for me to utilize my season pass this season? Oh boy, Elaine, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that one because so, so much depends on, you know, what you're able to do as somebody coming from, you know, Hampshire and coming into Burke, whether you can quarantine, whether quarantines will last all season. I do know that most mountains have put in pretty generous refund or rollover plans. So I'm not familiar with, with what Burke has exactly, but I think, you know, it's a good idea to look at it, see what your options are and then make some determination about whether you think you can actually come into the state and ski, you know, according to the current guidelines. And, you know, let's all hope that the, the vaccine is rolled out the way it's being talked about on the news today, that, you know, we can really start to get a significant number of people vaccinated at the end of, you know, February. That could really make for a very different spring than we saw last year. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? It's a, I, I, I hope that uh, that's possible. Um, we now are going to hear from Chuck of Wilmington. Chuck from Wilmington asks, what does a ski resort do when the honor system fails? We know there are out-of-state visitors coming and going without quarantine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Chuck, I think that's probably one of the, the dilemmas that we're going to be faced with. I don't think ski areas uh, can be and know how to be in, enforcers. I think if they are aware of something that is a, a you know, certainly a very overt um, um, disregard of the rules, I believe all of them have the power and will likely take action by revoking a ticket or revoking a pass. Mm. But, you know, it's really difficult to assume. You know, I was speaking to Ann earlier, and when I see somebody with Connecticut plates here in the Valley, you know, I can't assume that that person has not quarantined or they haven't been here for three months. Many people have. You know, I can't make that assumption. So that's why the attestation is being put back on the shoulders of the individual. And hopefully people are gonna act responsibly and if they don't, that puts the entire sport in jeopardy. So I have to have faith that people are going to be responsible, that they are going to do the right thing. But if they don't, and it's obvious, I think resorts will take action. And I, we know that resorts don't really like to do that unless they absolutely have to. No, <laughs> and no. You don't want to disappoint people no. who have paid, um, but that's how serious this is. Yeah. You know, I recognize I didn't answer part of the question earlier about injuries on the hill. And that's another good question too. Mm. Uh, yes, um, you know, if you get injured and you get taken, you know, to a hospital, you know, it could take away obviously the caring for, for other people. So I think it, it is especially important this year to focus on safety, ski in control, 
the skis safely and injuries are going to happen. Unfortunately, that's, that's the nature of the business. But I think we all can be even more careful than we normally are to make sure we don't put a burden on our first responders. It, it, it is so dicey for the healthcare community right now. But again, Anne, let me say that, you know, we all need, we're all going stir crazy. This has been <laughs> tough. <laughs> I mean, this has been it's nine true. months. It's, it's awful. And getting out of doors, recreating, you know, doing something like we did this summer, golfing or hiking or biking and skiing, you know, that's what we need. But we just have to make sure that we all are doing it responsibly, sensibly, and we don't have anything that's going to jeopardize it being shut down. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, your experience with the golfing situation this summer. Yeah. And yeah. how that might compare to well, what we could expect with well, skiing. Golfing was um, somewhat similar. And, you know, you had to make a reservation. You basically had to certify that you were following the state guidelines. Um, there were limitations. The, the golf range wasn't open, so you couldn't practice before you went to the, the first tee. People, for the most part, rode in their own golf cart. People wore masks. There was online ordering and pickup at the cafeterias. And I'm not aware of any incidents of infection in the summer here at Sugar Bridge. Uh, we also found something very interesting. We probably did 50 to 60% more golf rounds than we've ever done. We found that there was as much activity midweek as there was on weekend because people were working at home. They had more flexibility. So you didn't have that crowd on the weekends that you normally did. You had it spread out over seven days. Could this happen in the ski season? You know, that might be interesting to see. And if it does, you know, it's going to be better for the skier. It's going to be better for the resort. And it's going to create a better environment. So we'll just have to see as the season begins what actually occurs. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask another question here from the web form that we put up. Uh, this is from Steve, who lives in Middlesex. He wants to know about uh, cross-country skiing and whether you know um, whether the Nordic centers will be affected by COVID as well. Um, I'm not as familiar with the Nordic centers, but uh, they're going to be under the same guidelines as downhill. Uh, people are going to have to practice the same social distancing masking. You know, my guess is when you're out, you know, in the, on the trail by yourself, you're not going to be anywhere near anybody. You know, you can take your mask down uh, without jeopardizing anything. Um, Obviously, um, they're going to have to, you know, do exactly what the, the Alpine areas do downhill in terms of every other guideline followed. Backcountry, great question. If you talk to most of the retailers, they're going to say the sales are off the charts. Mm -hmm. Everybody is hedging their bet to a degree. First of all, backcountry has been growing in, um, in, in, in awareness. It's been growing in popularity. And I even bought some new equipment this year myself. Oh, so, you got it? So, you know, should an area get shut down, which I hope it won't, it's a little bit of a hedge that we can skin and go back country. Mm -hmm. So I do think that as going to be a growth, I think you're going to see more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you know, people who haven't done it need to be careful. You can't go in an area and you don't want to burden the first responders. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to see an increased usage of back country equipment this year. Um, out west, it's a little more challenging and concerning because they have avalanche danger out there. We don't have that for the most part in the East. So I know out West, they're quite concerned about people who aren't familiar with the territory getting into trouble, you know, in areas that they should not be in. Yes, it's a real risk in places like Colorado, for sure. Yeah. And also all, almost all the skiers I know do allow skinning at the resort. They have different policies. Some allow it during the course of lift operations. Many do not. Uh, so if you go again to every resort, you can find uh, what their skinning policies are, which is another way of enjoying the out of doors um, in, a, in a fun way. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question uh, from Laura of Burlington. And uh, Mike, can you cue this uh, question up? Laura from Burlington asks, my older kids had school sports canceled and ski school for one of our kids was postponed. Ski school for the older kids is set to start, though. I want to send them, but I'm not sure this is the right thing to do or whether it's even allowable. 
What's the official word on ski school programs? Uh, for the most part, group lessons are probably gonna be few and far between, but it's not, again, universal, I believe, how every ski area is gonna handle this. So again, you have to look at the ski resorts. But right now, private lessons certainly are allowable. Group lessons, again, under the current state guidelines, which are saying that there can't be any congregating by people from outside their own household, that type of group lesson is not permitted by the state. Mm -hmm. Some of the resorts are gonna maybe have their own limitations on it. I do know at Sugarbush, one of the things that was being thought about was really having related people doing their own groups. So you weren't in a group with strangers, but you were gonna be in a group with either members of your own family or members of a family that you were well aware of and comfortable being with. But that has actually been put on hold right now. So the group blazer programs have really been deferred until January, and then they're gonna to have to assess what is happening. So if you are interested in having a child, I'm not gonna say it's not gonna happen, but I think you wanna talk very specifically to the resort where you're planning to do it, to see exactly what they plan to do and also what they're allowed to do currently. Great. Yeah, everything is uh, everything has changed and school is uh, not not the way it was last no, it's year. Not. And again, that's why I said, you know, the word flexibility and planning, you know, it really, it, it's changing. So you just can't be as rigid as we were in the past, knowing what we did every single day, you know, it's easy that way. This is gonna be a lot more challenging. Uh, we have a question from Donald uh, who lives in Burlington. He says, it seems it would be safe for two mask wearing non-pod members to safely ride the side seats of the quads and stay safe in the breeze. He wants to know if that's true. <laughs> Um, I think most people believe that is true. I'm not going to be a doctor and a scientist, but again, the guidelines that we have received are, yes, that that is permissible and deemed to be safe. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, a, a fixed grip quad is going about 500 feet a minute. So there's a breeze blowing. Uh, a high speed quad is going about a thousand feet a minute. So a breeze is blowing. So Yes, I think the answer to your question is uh, people feel that that is a safe environment for two people on a quad seated apart. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, that, that's good to know. I guess uh, you don't have to always be in the single lift line then. There, no. are, there, there are other options. Um, uh, th there's another question about mask wearing from Colin in Burlington. And he wants to know how ski resorts will enforce the mask policy. And you've mentioned this before that someone could, could lose their pass if they're not following yeah. uh, the rules. Could you go into that a little bit more? This particular yes. person yeah, is I, worried. I think, about, I think yeah. what you're gonna see is that every ski area is gonna ask everybody to wear a mask when they're on premise, You know, once they come into the resort environment. And I believe most people, if somebody comes in with a mask not on or a mask not on properly, they're gonna be asked politely, would you please wear a mask? And if they say they refuse to wear a mask, I believe most areas will say they are not welcome to ski that day. Mm -hmm. And explain why, not just you know be arbitrary, but explain why that it is for the protection of you, protection of everybody. It is something that is being required and it jeopardizes everybody's activity if somebody is not wearing a mask. So, you know, please bear with it and wear a mask. And I'm sure most people will have masks available if somebody isn't wearing one or didn't bring one. Well, great. Um, we are almost at time here. And I know that um, people are really anxious to hear uh, the answers to the, their questions, um, but that's about all the time we have tonight. So uh, I wanna thank you again Wynn for joining us. And I wanna thank uh, Garnet Health for sponsoring us. Uh, Garnet Health provides both rapid antigen and PCR COVID-19 testing for individuals and businesses seven days a week. Uh, schedule a test today at their new location next to Burlington International Airport by visiting www.garnet.care slash testing. Wynn, I wanna thank you again. This has been terrific. I've learned a lot. I hope our readers have learned a lot. And we'll be posting uh, most of a transcript of tonight's um, Q&A so that people can 
find out uh, the answers to their questions. Right, so right. thank you again. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome, Anne. And let me just reiterate what I said very early on is look at the ski areas websites. They all have a tremendous amount of information on it. You can learn a lot on it. And I'm sure they all have guest service people willing to receive a call to if there is confusion. But anyway, I'm looking forward to skiing outside. I had my first day today. It was absolutely okay. fantastic. And I can't wait to go out again tomorrow with the mask. <laughs> that sounds terrific. Yes, we got some snow today too. So yes, we did. Tomorrow's, tomorrow morning is going to be good. <laughs> I think it will be. Absolutely. Well, have fun this winter win. Thank you again for taking the time. You're welcome, Anne. All right. Good night. Bye now.